Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia podcast here on my YouTube channel. Thanks so much for joining me. Now, throughout the day, of course, here on my YouTube channel, I used to I like to talk about the stuff going on in the world of movie news. But here on the John Campia podcast, I like to take the topics, opinions, and questions that you guys send to me. How do you send in a topic, opinion, or question? It's simple. Just email me anytime at the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. And make sure you're following me on Facebook and Twitter, simply at John Campia, because every once in a while I do a call for opinions and topics and questions from there as well. So those are the couple of ways you can get these things to me. Now, without any further ado, let's jump into it. The first topic today. And the first topic today is brought to us by Sebastian Lerda, who writes, Hi, John. I love your podcast. Watch it daily. Thank you so much, Sebastian. My question to you is, what is your take on the Dark Tower movie? Do you think it'll be far different from the books? Do you think it'll be a trilogy and a series? Um, Good question. Okay, look. So obviously we got this new Dark Tower movie coming out, stars Matthew McConaughey, Idris Elba, two of the best actors working today. So obviously I'm really excited about that as any film fan should. It's based on really solid source material. So everybody should be excited about that. I'm going to admit, as excited I am, as I am about the movie, I have not been doing cartwheels over the trailers. The trailers have not been blowing me away. I, I don't think they've been bad trailers, no, but they haven't been those trailers. Like, how long have we been waiting for a Dark Tower movie? I mean, we've all been waiting a pretty long time. So when the first trailer was coming out, I was extremely stoked. Like, I could not wait for this thing to drop. And then it dropped and it was okay. But I think like a lot of other people, I was not just hoping for okay. Like, clearly the best thing about these trailers so far are the, is the way in all the different trailers that Idris Elba is reloading his gun. Like whether it's the, or whether it's throwing the cartridge in the air and swing his gun around. That looks incredibly innovative. That looks really interesting. I can't wait to see that on the big screen. That's going to look great. However, I haven't, maybe it's just because they haven't given us the context, but I haven't been like wowed by the dialogue I'm hearing in it so far. I haven't been wowed by, you know, the man of black that we're getting from Matthew McConaughey. I haven't been wowed by just about anything. I'm not wowed by the kid. Now, that could just all be because of the trailers, you know, and we have often many times seen mediocre to bad trailers to great movies, just as we've seen many great trailers to bad movies. So I'm not going to read too much into that, except to say that the trailers haven't really been doing it for me. Now, when you ask the question about, you know, how close do I think they'll stick to the book? It's really impossible to say. You know, some people seem to think that the key to doing a book adaptation to film is to be as close to the book as possible. And I have to disagree. Um, you know, because the me the print is a different medium than the screen. When you write the book, you're writing a book in such a way that it's to be consumed by a reader sitting down over a course of hours and hours and hours and hours and days, reading it and digesting it a certain way. And you write it a certain way so it'll best be presented off the printed page. But movies are a different medium altogether. And I think you need to adapt for that reason. A great example that I think that is a an example of too close of an adaptation that did not work on the big screen was The Da Vinci Code uh, with Tom Hanks. I actually thought that movie, I mean, as much as a two hour movie can adhere to a hundreds and hundreds of a page of a book, but I thought that movie was pretty damn close to the book. To me, it was just too close because it didn't feel right on the screen. Like it, it didn't feel like this movie was made to be communicated on the big screen. And because of that, I actually think it suffered. Now, then you get some adaptations that suffer from adapting too much and going too far away from the source material. It's an art. There's a thin line, you know, that's right. That's just, just enough adaptation without becoming too much. It's a very narrow field and it takes skilled filmmakers and skilled story storytellers to find that right range and to nail it. So it still feels completely like the book, but it was adapted enough to be appropriate for the big screen in a different medium. Now, whether or not the Dark Tower is able to find that line. It's impossible to say at this point. We're just going to have to go in and watch the movie. I think we can tell from the trailers there's already going to be a few differences, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Again, it's just a trailer. We'll just have to see where it goes. Now, to the part of your question about will this be a trilogy, will it be a series, there's only one thing that will determine that. Box office. That's it. Do people go out in droves 
to see Dark Tower. If they do and it makes money, they'll be green lighting, you know, the sequel to it before day one is done or before the f- whole first weekend is even over. If they don't, then it doesn't matter how good the movie is. If people don't go out to see it and it loses the studio money, there's not going to be another one. It's really just that simple, but that's really what it all comes down to. So I'm hoping it's great. I'm hoping it's successful. You get a movie with Idris Elba and Matthew McConaughey together. You want it to be great. You have high hopes. So let's just wait and see. All right. Thanks a lot for the question. We move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Julia Vermoth, who writes, just saw Spider-Man Homecoming and I absolutely loved it. It might be my favorite movie of the year. My question is, is this the best Spider-Man movie ever? How would you rank the existing Spider-Man films? Thank you and bring on the filthy. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Julia. Yeah, um, Spider-Man Homecoming is out. I've seen it a couple times. I'm willing to bet an awful lot of you guys have seen it a couple times. Like everybody else, I was nervous. How was this marriage and collaboration between Sony and Marvel going to work out? I had talked to a number of people who had been working on the film. Marvel had one vision for the film. Sony had another vision for the film. And they really compromised and came up with a movie that is really effing special. I mean, I think it's a really special movie. I enjoyed it a great deal. And like I said, I've seen it multiple times already. I know you guys have. The last time I checked, the numbers might have moved. The last time I checked, it's got a 93% Rotten Tomatoes rating. It's got a 92% audience rating. So fans are loving it. The uh, critics are loving it. It opened to 117 million. That number might get adjusted a little bit up or low, but right now it's aiming for $117 million opening weekend, which exceeds expectations by about $17 million. It's a wonderful film. I had a great time watching it. Right now for me, it sits at number four as the number four best movie of the year I've seen so far. That's, of course, behind Logan, uh, The Big Sick, Baby Driver, which are tied for second, and then, of course, uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, which is my number four of the year so far. But how does it rank with the Spider-Man movies? Is it the best Spider-Man movie already? Well, look, the answer to that really depends on who you're talking to, because all film is subjective. Everybody's going to have a different list, for sure. But I'm going to tell you mine. So here's how I would rank the Spider-Man movies. It number five would be, sorry, number six. How many have there been now? Six? Yeah, we have had Spider-Man one, two, and three, the amazing Spider-Man one and two, and now we got Homecoming six. Okay, so coming in at number six, I think for a lot of people is Spider-Man three. Uh, that was by far the, I, to me at any rate, the worst Spider-Man film we've ever had. So Spider-Man three comes in at number six. At number five, would be the amazing Spider-Man 2. Real shame, too, that that movie was such, uh, you know, a nosedive in quality, a decline in quality, because I thought the amazing Spider-Man 1 was actually quite good. Which brings us to number four, which is, I think, the amazing Spider-Man. I think the amazing Spider-Man uh, comes in at number four. At number three would be Spider-Man 1, the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man that uh, got the whole thing going, got everything kicked off. Number two would be Spider-Man Homecoming for me. So Spider-Man Homecoming for me comes in as the second best Spider-Man movie behind Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2, which, you know, I still think Spider-Man 2 is one of the best comic book movies ever made. I I just think it's a fantastic film. It definitely belongs in the top 10 of the best comic book movies ever made. I think Spider-Man Homecoming, though, is a really solid, great entry for the film. Now, a lot of people are going to go back and forth. A lot of people are going to say Spider-Man Homecoming is their favorite of all time. I know a lot of people who really like the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man as being their favorite. And I think there's going to be a lot of people out there that agree with me that uh, Spider-Man 2 is going to be number one on the list for them. The real question, though, is how would you rank the Spider-Man films, assuming now that you've had a chance to see Spider-Man Homecoming? Make sure you jump down to the comments section. Let me know your thoughts. Rank them one to six and let me know where Homecoming comes on your list. Anyway, thanks a lot for the question, Julia. We move on to the next question. And this one comes to us from Rory Hogan, who writes, Hi, John. My question for you is this. Do you think all films can be considered art? Or do you think that many blockbuster franchises, such as Transformers, are merely made to sell tickets and have no artistic intentions whatsoever? Thanks. Well, look, I'm going to be honest with you. All film is art. Even even Transformers film. Here's what you can't do, because all art is subjective. That means there's going to be things you like and things you don't like. What you can't get yourself into the trap of doing is, oh, if there's a movie I don't like, that's not art. Yeah, it is. The number of people and the number of artists that go into work on that thing is insane. I mean, they look, the movie that you think might be the worst thing ever made, somebody poured a lot of their heart and soul into it. 
It's true. It doesn't mean it's not a bag of shit. It doesn't mean it's not a terrible movie. But it also doesn't mean just because it's a terrible movie that it wasn't artists working trying to create art. And just because you don't like it doesn't disqualify it from being that. And look, good art is good business. There's a reason that Transformers The Last Night only opened to $44 million in North America. There's a reason. Because the previous films have not been good. If the previous one, look, if the last Transformers movie, okay, if the last one that came out was awesome and people loved it, you think Transformers The Last Night would have only opened to $44 million in North America? Hell no. It would have opened to at least north of $100 million. Easy. So for Paramount, good art would have meant good business. It would have given them more money. Greed, as the great Gecko once said, is good. Greed works. For the studios they know, they have better long-term finance. They'll make more money if they put out good art. So they try to make good art. They try to make good movies. They want to make something the audience will like because they want to make it a franchise. And if they make something that people will like, then more people will come out to see it next time. Look at Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, Marvel puts out the first Guardians of the Galaxy. It's a smash hit with fans and a smash hit with critics, and it makes a good amount of money. But because people loved it, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 comes out and it makes even more money. So just because a movie sucks, like Transformers The Last Night sucks, don't think for a second, though, that there weren't hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people who wanted to make it good, who tried to make it good, who did the best they could to make it good. But look, making a good movie, I, I keep saying this all the time, people just think making a good movie, oh, it's just the easiest thing in the world. Making a good movie is nearly impossible. It's nearly impossible. So every time you see a good movie, Take a moment and really appreciate it because it ain't easy because all film is subjective. You got thousands of different people all working towards the same goal, trying to make it happen with different ideas and different talents. And you got an audience out there with millions of different tastes and millions of different points of view. And you're trying to make a movie that appeals to them and accomplishes something, hopefully. So when a studio makes a good movie, take a moment when you come out of the theater and really appreciate that because it ain't freaking easy to do. So look, yeah, I absolutely believe that every time you've seen a bad movie, every bad movie you've seen was a studio's attempt and filmmaker's attempt to make a good movie. They just weren't able to do it. And that's fine. But don't ever think there's a difference or there's no difference between, oh, they wanted to make a movie that people liked. Instead, they just wanted to make money. No, 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 no. Studios know if you make movies that people like, you will, maybe not immediately, but you will in the long term, make more money. Guardians of the Galaxy is a great example of that. Transformers is a great example of it, of what happens when you fail. But they were trying. They were absolutely trying. And don't ever fool yourself into thinking any movie ever got made that wasn't for the money. They're all made for the money. No investor ever put up $50 million, whether it's a studio or an indie company or whatever, no investor ever put up $10 million, $50 million, $100 million if they didn't think they were going to get some money back. Nobody has ever done that. So movies is this great amalgamation of art and business. And because it's a great amalgamation of art and business, we've gotten some great cinema. And unfortunately, we've gotten some bad cinema too. But I think that was going to be the case regardless. So yes, I do think Transformers, as bad as it is, and as horrible as it is, I do think Transformers The Last Night was art. It didn't appeal to me, but guess what? No matter how bad I say Transformers last night is, there are people out there who enjoyed it. And that's the beautiful thing about the, uh, the subjectivity of film is that there are going to be people out there who like it, even though a lot of us think it's terrible. So, yes, I think it's art. I just think it's art that failed. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot for the question, man. All right, we move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Bradley Davis. And Bradley Davis writes, Hello, John. I think we might be in for a down year when it comes to animated films. The only great one I can think of right now is the Lego Batman movie. So with that in mind, what are the chances that the Lego Batman gets nominated for best animated film? Yeah, uh, the Lego Batman movie was a pleasant surprise. Uh, I've mentioned this before. Lego Batman was a great side character, supporting character in the Lego movie. I didn't know if that shtick 
that the Lego Batman had. I didn't know if that shtick could carry its own movie. And then I saw the Lego Batman movie and I absolutely adored it. I thought it was wonderful. And yeah, to me, it's the best animated film of the year so far. Absolutely. There have also been some disappointing films this year so far. Like, for instance, Despicable Me 3 is in theaters right now. I love Despicable Me 1 and 2. Didn't care so much about the Minions movie, but I was really hoping for a great return to form for the Despicable Me 3. I like the trailers a lot. And I don't think Despicable Me 3 was bad, but it was meh. I forgot about it pretty quickly, and I have no intentions of going back to see it again, to be honest with you. Now, also, another a big Pixar film came out, Cars 3. Now, I'll admit, I wasn't expecting much from Cars 3 because Cars, they just haven't been all that good. Just, I didn't, actually didn't think the first Cars was all that bad, to be honest with you. I think the first Cars had some heart. The second Cars was terrible. So I really didn't have high expectations, but still, it's Pixar. You know, it's John Lasseter. So I still go into it hoping that is going to be something really good. And I actually quite like the trailers for Cars 3, but I did not like the movie at all. I thought it was actually pretty bad. So what are some other ones we've got here coming out? We've got uh, Coco. <clears throat> Pardon me. We've got Coco coming out, which is another Pixar film. I think that's going to be a special movie. There's just something about the trailers and something about the synopsis that makes me think this is going to be a special little movie. So keep your eye out for Coco. That could be that could be the best animated film of the year. We'll have to see. No telling right now because, you know, the movie's not out yet. There's Coco. Lego Ninjago. I have not liked the trailers for that. The My Little Pony movie. Do I really need to say anything? The Nut Job 2. I didn't like the Nut Job 1. I don't think anything is going to persuade me that the Nut Job 2 is going to be any better. The Emoji movie's coming out, and that looks like crap. And I don't just mean the shit emoji. I mean, the movie looks like crap. That trailer was terrible. Uh, what else do we got? We got, oh yeah, Smurfs Lost Village. How can we forget Smurfs Lost Village? That sucked. Uh, Rock Dog sucked. Uh, Sing was not good at all. Now, there's this other animated film. I think it's coming out from DreamWorks. It's about uh, this bull called uh, Ferdinand. And it's about a bull uh, who gets involved in bullfighting. That could be interesting. So I'm curious about that. So really, the only film that I think has been really worth watching so far animated-wise is Lego Batman movie. And the only two films that I'm actually looking forward to animated-wise are Coco and Ferdinand. Those are the two that I think have some promise. Uh, Lego Ninjago, maybe that could surprise us. Maybe. Um, Lego has given us two quality movies so far. Let's see what happens with the Ninjago. Like I said, I just haven't liked the trailer so far. But other than that, you're right. It looks like a pretty down year for animated film. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Caleb Morrison, who writes, After seeing the news of Daniel day Lewis's retirement, I am curious to know... Who do you believe can take up the mantle of or is the best working actor today? Yeah, uh, I was, as a film fan, I was devastated to hear that Daniel Day-Lewis was retiring. He's got a movie coming out in December and apparently that he's doing with Paul Th uh, Thomas Anderson. And apparently after that, he's done. He's not going to do any more films. And I do contend he is the best actor in the world today. And you could make an argument that he is the greatest actor to ever live. He's actually the only lead actor, only male lead actor, to ever win three Academy Awards for Best Lead Actor. A couple have won two. A uh, few have won several lead and supporting actors, but only one guy has ever won three Best Lead Actor Academy Awards, and that's Daniel Day-Lewis. He is the best there, maybe the best there is, best was, and best there ever will be. He is the Bret Hart of acting, if you will. And so he's announced that he's going to be retiring. I certainly hope it's because he just wants to cobble shoes and not because there's any kind of an illness or sickness or something like that. We don't know. And I don't want to speculate on that right now. But it does leave the question then. So if the king steps down, if King Daniel Day-Lewis steps down, who takes on the throne? Who wears the crown as the best actor living today? There are some names that I believe are going to be in the conversation. So I'm going to list off some names that I believe are going to be in the conversation. Then I'll list off the two guys that I think it really comes down to, okay? Some of the people are going to be in the conversation. Leonardo DiCaprio is going to be in the conversation. Denzel Washington is obviously going to be in the conversation. Christian Bale is going to be in the conversation. Matthew McConaughey is going to be in the conversation. Tom Hanks is going to be in the conversation. Joaquin Phoenix is going to be in the conversation. Those are all guys I think can be in the conversation. Maybe there's some others that I'm leaving out. But honestly, I believe it comes down to two other guys. And neither of them are super popular. But I do believe when you just look at the work of acting, 
I don't know other than Daniel Day-Lewis that there are two guys who do it better than these two guys. They're not in popular movies, whatever, but I believe they're awesome. One is a guy I've said for a while, which is Russell Crowe. And there was a time when I thought Russell Crowe, Russell Crowe might have been the best actor in the world. Uh, and then Daniel Day-Lewis just proved again and again, no, Daniel Day-Lewis is the best actor in the world. Russell Crowe. Now, you may not like, look, this is the thing. This is what drives me a little bit crazy. A lot of film fans equate whether an actor was in a movie they loved as to whether or not they're a great actor or not. Russell Crowe has not been a lot of, in a lot of fan favorite films other than, you know, Gladiator. His performance in Cinderella Man was incredible. His, his performance in Mystery Lasko was absolutely jaw-droppingly good. Uh, he's just, every time he turns out, he turns in a world-class performance. That's what he does. He's not super popular, but I don't give a fuck. I don't care, I don't care what is who's popular or not. I care about who's the best acting talent. And when Russell Crowe is on screen and he is acting, he commands the screen. He owns the screen when he's on screen. And I just think he's one of the best in the world today. The other guy that I think is in that conversation is another dude who's not even an A-lister at all today. But when he's on screen, he's the best actor on screen. And that's Ray Fiennes. Ray Fiennes, uh, Voldemort himself, I believe is really one of the high ranking contenders for that crown of best actor in the world. Whenever he's in a movie, he's the best actor in that movie. Just the way it is. Just the way it is. He's the best. He may not be the most popular. He may not be the A-list guy. He might not be the star. But when he's in a movie, he's the best actor in that movie. And you want to know who are the best actors? Talk to actors. I've heard so many actors when talked about who are your inspirations today. So many of them say Ray Fiennes. Um, the dude is just badass. And you know, his brother ain't half bad either. Joseph Fiennes is actually a really good actor too. He's amazing, actually. He just, but again, he's not never had the big break other than Shakespeare in Love. I mean, he's never been the guy. He's never been an A-lister. He's never even been a real household name. But those two brothers are just incredibly good uh, individually. So yeah, but absolutely. Look, I'm not going to argue against you if you say Denzel Washington, because yeah, I think there's a good case to be made for Denzel. I think there's a good case to be made for Leonardo. I think there's a good case to be made for Christian Bale. I think there's a really good case to be made for Matthew Cane. Tom Hanks is a two-time Academy, like best lead actor Academy Award winner. He's the only guy on this list that I think that is. Uh, so the, I wouldn't argue against you if you had one of those names. But like for me, if we're, and then film is subjective and actors are subjective, for me, it come, the finalist, the, the two names it really comes down to is Russell Crowe and Rafe Fiennes. Uh, so yeah, that's my thought on it at any rate. Uh, man, I really hope Daniel Day-Lewis changes his mind though. The guy's got so much more to offer. Anyway, okay. And we move on now to the last question of the day. And the final question today comes to us from Humphrey Rogers who writes, superhero films are big. And while I love them to death, do you believe they are indirectly to blame for Hollywood's reliance on brand name franchise filmmaking? Many original films have to be auteur driven while a film like Battleship gets greenlit instantly. What are your thoughts? Well, there's a couple things to keep in mind here. Number one, it's not like superhero movies was the first incarnation of Hollywood's dependence on recognizable brand. Hollywood's had a dependence on recognizable brand forever. Like whether the brand was an external property or whether the brand was a particular actor or whether the brand was something else altogether. Hollywood has always had a reliance on name recognition, whether the name is World War II or whether the name is Elvis Presley or whether the name is Battleship. Hollywood's always had a bit of a reliance on pre-existing awareness of a brand. You think Elvis Presley got leading roles in movies because he was a great actor? No, but he was Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley, he was a brand. He was the most popular name in the world. So you put him in movies. You know, that's just always been a part of it. And now we have the comic book and superhero genre because it's successful and it's working. Are though brands like this and brands like superhero movies, because superhero movies now have, are more popular than any other type of brand has ever been. So that's great. That's wonderful. But are they indirectly to, to blame for, you know, uh, original films? No, no, they're not. They're not. You know, it's to blame for more original films, not really getting bigger bumps and whatever. The audience is to blame. That's, that's it. 
When a movie like Nice Guys with the aforementioned Russell Crowe uh, and Ryan Gosling comes out and is amazing and is awesome and it barely makes any money at all, despite the fact that it had great actors in it, had a great director, Shane Black, it had great marketing and promotion, the trailers were fantastic. There's no one to blame but the audience if the audience decides not to go out to see it and support it. When you got a movie like Baby Driver, which granted for Baby Driver, a $21 million opening weekend is by far the biggest opening weekend of any Edgar Wright film ever, but it's still just $21 million. And Baby Driver right now for me is tied with the number as the number two best film of the year so far. So when you get incredible, great, high quality film being made by studios, they're making the great original films. They're making them. It's just that you're not going out to support them. The audience is not going out to support them. When you have a movie like The Big Sick that's out right now. Now, granted, The Big Sick did not have a big marketing campaign. A lot of people aren't even aware of Big Sick, so you can't really blame the audience for that. But it's just an example. Studios are putting out great original films. They are. It's just that people don't go out and support them. So like I said, the two number, the two films this year that are tied for my second best film of the year so far, The Big Sick, Baby Driver, wonderful, original, creative films that not a lot of people are going to go see, despite the fact that in Baby Driver's case, there was a great marketing campaign for it. In the case of something like The Nice Guys, there was a great marketing campaign for it. Every month, great original films come out. It's one of the biggest things that drives me crazy. I still hear people saying, Hollywood doesn't make original movies anymore. Yes, they fucking do. Yes, they fucking do. All you got to do, go to a release list and look at, look, go on to uh, IMDb or whatever and look up the, you know, the film release schedule and you run down it. There's an awful lot of freaking original films, far outnumber the non-original ones. Okay. They're out there. They're there. It's just about whether or not you want to go see them. Now that brings up the question of, well, then is that then in a way comic book movies, because people are choosing to go see comic book movies. Is that then in a way make comic book movies responsible for people not going to see other movies? No, I have never accepted the excuse that something's, anything's success is the reason for something else's failure. Not in an open market, not when people can do and experience multiple things. Like, yes, if you're in the Olympics and only one person can win the gold medal and that means everybody else is going to have to win silver, bronze or nothing, that's different. But you're if you're in an open market like the movies, right? One thing's success does not give an excuse for something else to fail. It just doesn't. I remember back in the day when I used to run my website, The Movie Blog. And, you know, right now the number one movie website out there is probably Screen Rant. And it's great. And that was founded by a buddy of mine, Vic Holterman. He, he's, he has since sold the website and moved on to other things, but he did a great job starting that site. But I remember, you know, S Screen Rant and the movie blog. I mean, I think movie blog was even bigger than Screen Rant for a while, but there were sites like, uh, Cinematical. There were sites like Screen Rant, Peter over at Slash Film, uh, myself at the movies, Vic at Screen Rant. And we all used to, you know, communicate with each other. We would email each other and all that kind of stuff. We would give suggestions to each other, stuff like that, because we all understood that if Slash Film succeeds, that doesn't mean people won't also read Screen Rant. What we found was that a lot of the readers of Screen Rant and a lot of the readers of the movie blog and a lot of the re readers of Cinematical and a lot of the readers of Slash Film, a lot of the readers would read all the other sites too. So if one site was struggling, it wasn't because people were reading the other sites. No, what we found was a lot of the audience reads multiple sites. So one thing's success is not an excuse for another thing's failure. So no, I've never bought, even when it's coming from like great respected filmmakers who I adore and respect greatly, even when I hear it from some of them that comic book movies are the reason that, no, 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 that's bullshit. That's just a lame excuse. Don't make excuses for certain films failures. There are reasons for certain film failures, but don't make it the success of something else is why something else fails. I do not buy that flawed logic whatsoever. People don't just see one movie a year. Ah, some people do, but moviegoers go to see multiple films a year. They can go see a comic book movie. They can go see 
Spider-Man Homecoming. They can go see Wonder Woman and they can go see Baby Driver and The Big Sick. Not everybody goes to five movies a month, but it's, it's just the point is this, is that one thing's success does not mean something else fails. One thing's success is not an excuse for something else's failure. So no, I do not accept the fact that there's a genre in it right now that is experiencing wonderful success is the reason to blame why people won't go to see other types of movies. No, great original film not getting the audiences they deserve goes all the way back to the 50s. I mean, it's not a new thing. So yeah, I personally, I kind of reject that logic altogether. If anything, the comic book movies are carrying the entire industry right now. Because you know that my belief on this, my philosophy on this, when people go to a movie theater and they have a great time, they want to go back to the movie theater again. And right now, comic book movies are the main movies that people are going out and having a good time at. So I think if anything, it's buoying up, it's lifting up the rest of the film industry. So if you think the rest of the film industry is struggling, just how, just think how bad it would be struggling if it wasn't for the comic book genre, giving positive experiences and bringing in lots of money at the box office to fund those other films. So no, I don't believe it all. And I, I reject the notion that the success of the comic book genre or any genre is to blame for the failure of lack of original films, which by the way, there are no lack of original films. There's tons of original. There are more original films that get produced today than at any other time in Hollywood history. Yes, there's also more comic book films and sequels and reboots produced today than any other time in history, but both are true because more movies in general are being produced today than any other time in history. So original films are out there. Original films are being greenlit. It's just that not of the original films get the support that they need and deserve. And that's up to number one, audiences to give them a shot, but it's also up to those of us who do see those movies to spread the word, to get the word out that, you know what? The Big Sick is one of the best movies of the year. Baby Driver is one of the best films of the year. A Ghost Story is one of the best films of the year. Nice Guys is one of the best films of the year. It's up to those of us who did go out and give it a shot to really become a champion for those films and let other people know, and hopefully more people will check them out. Anyway, that's just my thoughts. What do you think about that or any of the topics that we discussed here today on the John Campy Podcast? Please just jump into the comments section and leave your thoughts and your opinions. Start the conversation. I want to hear what you guys have to say. I want to remind you guys, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Make sure you're following me on social media, on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. And like I like to remind you guys every episode, I love using the app, share the meal. All of us, you, me, everybody, we want to change the world for somebody and make the world a better place for somebody. There's very few things that are as easy and as inexpensive to do it than with the app, share the meal. Just open up the app, hit the share the meal button, and you've donated $3.50. What can $3.50 do? It feeds a starving kid for a week. Just hitting that button once, boom, you fed a kid for a week. That's how easy and cheap it is to change the world for somebody. Check it out. I think you'll get addicted to the app like I have. Anyway, that'll do it for me, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. And until next time, bye-bye.